Good evening. My name is Donald Milan from Chagosk, the Agricultural Advisory Research and Education Authority. I am the Regional Manager for the Tipperary Region, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in this year's Tell Me About series. We all know that 2020 has presented us all with many challenges, and not least was the unwelcome visitor to our lives of the COVID-19 virus. But we are delighted to collaborate with the Trinity College Dublin Letterkenny IT and IT Carlo on this innovative project to highlight many of the health and wellness challenges that are facing rural communities as we face into the winter months in the midst of this global pandemic. I would like now to introduce you to Paul Horn, Assistant Professor in Intellectual Disability Nursing at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Trinity College Dublin, who will explain a little more to you about the Tell Me About series. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I greet you tonight as the chairperson of the Civic Engagement Committee at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Trinity College Dublin. We have been running the Tell Me About Lecture series in college for a number of years now. But due to COVID-19, like everybody else, this year we can only interact through your computer screens, tablets or mobile phone screens. With the TV production magic of our colleagues in IT Carlo, we have created this year's programme, which will focus on rural health and wellness, featuring narratives from the lives of some well-known Irish people, blended with scientific contributions. In essence, it's a mixture of the heavy and light, akin to a COVID-19 trauma August a trauma. Our host for tonight's programme will be the National Director of Chagask, Professor Jerry Boyle. COVID-19 has presented with us with a whole new array of words and statistics to describe the spread of the virus. Our next presentation is from Catherine Comiskey, Professor of Healthcare Modelling and Statistics at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Trinity College, Dublin. And Catherine will talk to us in an attempt to unpick this whole new language. Her presentation is entitled COVID-19 and Asymptomatic Cases, Learning from the Past and Planning for the Future. Hello, my name is Professor Catherine Comiskey and I'm based at Trinity College Dublin in the School of Nursing and Midwifery. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Paul Horn and the public lecture series at Trinity College School of Nursing and Midwifery to inviting me to speak to you today about COVID-19 and asymptomatic cases and for how we can learn from the past and plan from the future. So I'm delighted to present this work to you today. I will tell you that it's also brand new work and that we have some of the very first results on asymptomatic cases available for you to see and hear about today. So thank you. So my name is Professor Catherine Comiskey. I'm a professor in healthcare statistics and I work with a great team at Trinity College Dublin. I have interest in epidemiology, in infectious diseases, HIV and AIDS, people who use drugs. And I recently published a book called Addiction Debates, which is looking at all the hot topics from policy to practice in the addiction field, building originally from my work on HIV and AIDS. So today, in this lecture, I would like to go through a little bit about what is known about the current epidemiology of COVID-19 in Ireland. I would like to talk about the reproduction number or and potential vaccination rates required. I'll show us how we can learn from past epidemics. And finally, we'll look at estimating the number of asymptomatic or hidden cases in Ireland, which are actually contributing to the silent spread of infection and we're going to look at some of the best and worst case scenarios. And this is new results that have just uh, emerged in the last week. So this is a familiar picture you will have seen. You will have seen what we've talked about as the incidence. The incidence with an epidemic is the number of new cases each day. And every day, we've all heard it on the nine o'clock news, how the numbers are increasing every day. 
And in this graph, you can see the first wave of the epidemic where we had very, very rising incidents up to a peak in mid-April. And then we think just looking at the details of those cases, we can see that our older populations, both rural and urban, have had a disproportionate amount of cases uh, within their mists. So we see here that this is the danger with this disease is that in actual fact, in the first wave of the epidemic, it affected higher rates of our older populations rather than our younger populations. And this graph shows that. And it's these vulnerable populations that we have to pr protect. We've also heard about the OR number. So the reproductive number of the disease. It starts off being called the basic reproductive number, which is or not, and it's the number of secondary cases which one case would produce in a completely susceptible population. When we're looking at vaccination, the more appropriate number or metric is what we call the effective reproduction number. And this is the number that we hear reported in the news now, the effective reproduction number. This doesn't assume a completely susceptible population because we have the now the virus amongst our population. When the OR number is over one, an epidemic will spread. So each person will infect at least one other person. And we need to reduce that number below one so that the epidemic can die out. With other diseases, the way we do that is by vaccination. And we can look at the OR number for other infections. So we can learn, as I said, from other infections. So with other infections, for example, measles, we have to vaccinate 94% to keep that OR number down below one. For mumps, it's 89%. 86% for rubella, that's German measles, and 80% for poliomyelitis. So what we can see from this is that it's easier, say, to eradicate polio than it is to eradicate measles. And that's why sometimes we have measles outbreaks in communities, because not every child has been vaccinated and this R number goes up and we can um, see the infection rising in the community. But we do know from these past epidemics that if we keep the R number below one, the epidemic will die out. Unfortunately, at the moment, with COVID-19, we do not have a vaccine. So we have to reduce the OR number in other ways. We can also learn from HIV and AIDS epidemics. With the early stages of HIV and AIDS, a lot of people didn't know that they were HIV positive until they actually got AIDS. So we were able to say, well, how many uh, have HIV? We're able to look at that and say, how many people actually have HIV and they don't know that they have it? Because with HIV, there's a very, very long uh, incubation period. And quite often in the early stage of the epidemic, people only knew they had AIDS when they actually began to get sick. So looking at this, it's a really not important in terms of this talk, the mathematics of it, but these are the sort of mathematics that we can use, that we can learn from other epidemics. So when we know the number of AIDS cases and we know the incubation period, we can work out the number of HIV cases those AIDS cases came from. And that's work that I did, oh, a good number of years ago, um, out in DCU at the time uh, with Heather Ruskin and Alistair Wood, two great mathematicians and statisticians, and work that I did more recently looking at her hidden heroin epidemics with Dr. Orla Dempsey in Trinity College. So we can actually use our mathematics to find out or to estimate the number of hidden cases. And that's what I've been working on in Trinity uh, in the last few months. So my aim is to work out the number of hidden asymptomatic COVID-19 cases and also perhaps people who have been symptomatic who haven't been tested. So we're trying to estimate the hidden number of cases. To do that, we need to know the number of known cases and also the incubation period. So let's take a look first at the incubation period. 
So we have done in my team, in my group in Trinity College with Dr. Sonam Banka, who's a postdoctoral research fellow working with me, we've actually looked at the incubation period for COVID-19. So the incubation period is the time between exposure, actually getting the infection, and the onset of clinical symptoms. So I'll just say that again. The incubation period is the time between when you're exposed to infection and the onset of clinical symptoms. So you may have been exposed a number of days before you actually get symptoms. The problem is a person may become infectious, that is able to transmit the infection to another person at any moment of the infection. And this moment will actually vary per disease. So we've taken a look at this incubation period and we've looked at it all over the world, myself and Dr. Banka. And we know from the HSE they, that the reported incubation period is an average five to six days. But it can be as long as 14 days before you show symptoms. And during that time, you could be infectious. So quarantine, they're saying, should be in place for 14 days from the last exposure to a confirmed case. But what if you don't know you've been exposed because the case may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic? So we took a look at, I think it was 64 studies across the world, myself and Sonam Banka, Dr. Banka, and 30 of those studies looked at the incubation period, gave us details on the mean incubation period and the HSE is saying it's on average five to six days. But taking a look at those 30 studies, look at how the incubation period, these blue dots are the mean, but the little, uh, if you like, whiskers around the dots, the line around the dots are actually the, uh, what we call the confidence intervals. This is really how much it might actually be. So there is still great variation, as you can see, in the mean incubation period before you display symptoms. But you may be pre-symptomatic or you may not have any symptoms, but you could be infectious. So that is why we should be quarantining 14 days at least from the last exposure to a confirmed case. But the challenge is we don't know necessarily that we have been exposed to a case because if the case is asymptomatic or hasn't been confirmed. And this is the challenge. So working with our back calculation model that we l learned how to work with when we we're working with HIV and AIDS and numbers of people who use heroin, we can actually try and work back and say, from the known cases, how many hidden or unknown cases? So I'm working with another uh, postdoctoral fellow of mine in my group, Dr. Anne Snell, and we're looking at, this is the first wave of the epidemic here on the right. This is how it increased and then it decreased. And this is the summer period where we had very few cases. So we're focusing on the first wave for just for the moment. And this is the known daily cases to the 31st of July. Right up and we can see how they have decreased. But we have been able to use the back calculation method with the incubation period and we're being able to estimate the hidden cases. Looking at the known cases to the 31st of May, we could see just by adding them up that there were about 25,000 known cases. That was known through testing. Using the back calculation method, we have estimated there were an additional at least 25 or 26,000 hidden and unknown cases who have not been tested. And this, we believe, is actually the best case scenario. So we are saying, based on the back calculation method, we can say that for every known case, there is at least one unknown or hidden or asymptomatic case. So we may have double the number of cases that we know we have. So when we're out in the community, there are actually a lot more cases that haven't been tested, that maybe are asymptomatic, or may indeed have symptoms, but have not been tested. So there are at least double the number of cases. And that, in our estimation, is actually the best case scenario. 
We've also looked at what is known as the infection fatality ratio. And this is quite a difficult thing to estimate. Um, so there's, we're less confident with these results. Okay. So the infection fatality, out of all people infected, how many fatalities do we have? So this, because we are less is known about the infection fatality ratio, this we believe is the worst case scenario. Working with the infection fatality ratios of half to 1%, that's estimated across the EU, and working with the known cases up to the 31st of May, this was just looking at the peak, we have been able to estimate, we know there are 1,652 deaths, but we have been able to estimate using the infection fatality ratios that there may actually be 140 to 300,000 unknown cases. This is considerably worse than the previous case where we said there may be 25,000. This is what we call the worst case scenario. And in this case, for every known infection, there may be up to 5.5 to 12 unknown infections. And that is why it is so important to be um, isolating and social distancing within the community, because we do not know how many actual people have had this infection. But I can tell you today that it is at least twice as many than what we know we have, and it may indeed be five to 12 times as many in the worst case scenario. But all is not hopeless. I think if we look at the words of uh, Michael Ryan, who I think we've all now come to know and love from the World Health Organization and admire, in his words, he says, I think it's important to put this on the table. This virus may never go away. It may just become another epidemic, endemic virus in our communities. It may never go away. HIV, as we know, has not gone away. We've come to terms with the virus. We found the therapies and we found the prevention methods. We haven't found the vaccine yet. I think similarly we can say the same for infections from measles, mumps to polio and winter flus. Before we had a vaccine we learned how to live with and protect our younger and our older rural and urban communities. We recall before we had vaccination that when a child in the family had measles the other children might have been kept home from school. They all got measles in, the, in their family home. If the child went into school, the others got the measles. If a child had a, if a person in the, in the household had the winter vomiting bug, we kept them isolated. It's the same here. We reduce mixing. We abide by guidance. And we come through. We have come came through with HIV and AIDS and we came through as a, better, as a better world as a result of it. And I think what I find encouraging is that we can also recall that after the Black Death in world, you know, in 1350s came the beautiful period of the Renaissance. And that, to me, gives me great hope. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Nikki Brennan, of course, well known as former president of the GAA, but also uh, he's been very actively involved in Age Action Kilkenny and Age Action Ireland. You're very welcome, Thank you, Nicky. Delighted to be here. Yeah. Um, I know you were a key player in, in, in driving the whole idea of a, an Age Action friendly community in Kilkenny. What does being a, an Age a, a friendly community actually mean in practical terms? Well, I suppose in, in practical terms, it's, I suppose, our slogan in Kilkenny is to, for example, is to make Kilkenny a great place in which to grow old. I mean, at its simplest, that's what it is. And that's really the, 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 the vision for every age-friendly county in the country. Uh, and that's something we try to attain. Now, you do that through a multiple series of areas that we work with. The agencies who are involved in the whole age-friendly programme in Kilkenny are people like the local authority, people like the Gardaí, people like the HSC and its, and its Spanish connections, people like the, uh, the, 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 
sporting community, um, as I said, the Gardaí, people like that. They were all part of helping, and the business community, of course, trying to make the whole life of elderly people easier to, uh, to live, now, be that rural or be it, uh, be it urban, because when people get old, I mean, they have some frailties, and uh, so many different parties then need to help them, the Gardaí in terms of safety, the HSE in terms of the various medical services that they would that they would require. The business community needs to be more cognizant of older people as well and, and how it should deal with older people when they come into their premises. Um, so they're just some idea. And even when it comes to the whole leisure side, it's still important that older people have a need for leisure activities and perhaps even more important that they have some way of, of, of enjoying that. They're just some examples mm. of, uh, of how the whole age friendly program and older people then are part of groups that are influencing things like for example they're part of the the local policing authority they they they, they set about how the local authority should develop the streets and footpaths of be it kilkenny be it the rural villages around the the county they have input into that and and they're recognized as a very important source of input into how these areas are now developed of course uh, as they should be and of course, in the context of, the, of living with COVID as we have been for the last eight or nine months and heading into now another period of restrictions for the next six weeks, can you give us any practical examples of how communities could actually help elderly from your experience in Kilkenny? Well, I think obviously COVID in particular, but, not, but even before COVID, rural communities in particular, it has changed a lot now. You've, you've, rural Ireland has undergone huge changes. You and your colleagues in Chagas would have seen that from the whole agricultural base that the, the, the whole farming scene has changed changed a lot. But in rural Ireland now, you, uh, you, you difficulty at the one particular difficulty at the moment is, is access to church services. Going to Mass is still very important for, for rural communities, rural, urban communities, yes, as well, but rural communities. The, uh, the post office is closed locally. They now depend on the man coming in the van, who is fantastic. We'll chat to them, but now that level of interaction is not quite what it used to be. The local pub is no longer open, and in many of them, have rural pubs have closed if they'd like to go down for a pint. Um, the local agricultural branch is probably not now as active as it used to be because a lot of the transactions are online. It's more difficult to walk the roads now because of cars on the roads. So the rural, the rural older person is finding it very difficult uh, in their environment at the moment. And of course, then they have to grapple with the whole area of their personal security. They worry that somebody is coming in and, uh, and, and taking their, going to rob them and things like that. So they lock down early in the evening and that whole type of life, certainly it's the mental anguish that that causes is certainly immense. And how can the rest of the community help the elderly who find themselves in, you know, cocooning as they have been for the last while and again heading into another period? How can the rest of the community help the elderly in practical ways? I think that's a very good question, Jerry. I think a couple of things here is that, first of all, the local policeman is still very important, the local guard, the community alert. They're very important elements of, uh, of safety. Then during the whole COVID time, but not, not exclusively during COVID, where older people had to stay at home, had, were confined to their house, local groups, particularly led by the G8, must be said, but not exclusively, they got involved in delivering groceries, delivering messages, uh, delivering medicines and various other, other things. And that helped enormously to, uh, to, to support elderly people in their community. And they kept an eye out on people as well. They were, they were seeing how... Johnny down the road or Mary up the, up, the, up the Boreen, how they were and they were keeping an eye on them because some of those people may not have family living locally. They may be living in, they may not be, they may be in a foreign land someplace and that made it more difficult. Equally, older people like that are not maybe overly adept to technology. The notions of saying to them, look, could you talk to somebody on FaceTime or talk to them on Zoom doesn't mean anything to them. Perhaps there's not even broadband in the area. So there are many challenges there. So that's why local communities and rural communities especially were fantastic during the, uh, the first part of COVID there when the lockdown has taken place. And that will now be very much needed during the six weeks that's upon us. And it seems to me as well, Nikki, that it's very important that if we are assisting the elderly in our community, we respect their dignity and their need for independence and so on. And we don't just jump in, if you like, with, all, with, with, with offers of assistance. We do it sensitively. Yeah, and I, th I think you're right there. There are some people that you will know that will, will happily uh, look, take the help that's offered because there's somebody that's 
in the community, they're out and about, they maybe used to be involved in sport or they might be in the ICA, whatever it might have been, but others maybe are more private and they may be reluctant to ask. So that has to be handled in a sensitive way. And perhaps going through your local priest might be useful, going through your local doctor. If there's not family members around and explain to the, uh, to the individual that there are people out there more than willing to help, they're not going to intrude on your life, but you're happy to be able to do that. But an important development, Jerry, that I would like to mention is, is the Alone organisation, the organisation that was founded by Willie Birmingham in Dublin many years ago. Now, in Kilkenny, Alone has, uh, has taken on the work of what was previously called the Carlo Kilkenny Contact Centre, which was helping older people with care and repair services and, and many other services as well. It's now has a, its own befriending service it, that's also working in Donegal and a number of other areas. But this is where volunteers have been trained to be able to engage with older people on the phone. This is with the permission of their family, of course. Mm -hmm. Engage with older people on the phone, have a conversation with them periodically, maybe, maybe once a week, twice a week, or once a month, whatever the family thinks would be appropriate. Check in them, see how they're doing, have they taken their medication, have they got their groceries, do they need any help? And that's recorded on a system so that the next person who calls, and this is all done by volunteers, but it means the family then can be notified if the person who's calling them from the alone office, who are well trained on how to deal with these matters and sensitive matters, mm. uh, they can tell the family that if they're happy or if there's a concern about somebody. But usually that person is calling from the alone office might very well be the only phone call that person mm. will get in a day or in every couple of days. And that's why for many people, it's a lifeline mm. to the outside world. And I mean, what you're talking about there, Nikki, in terms of the, the difficulties that people face being isolated and alone, it predates uh, COVID, of course. You know, it's part and parcel, particularly of rural Ireland, but also urban Ireland as well. But maybe in a funny sort of way, maybe COVID has given us an opportunity to be more proactive. Oh, there's no question about that, but yeah. it also means that the whole issue of neighbourliness, which maybe we as a country had lost somewhat of, yeah. uh, as the whole country developed and we came out of the, the whole Celtic Tiger era, maybe we became more impersonal as individuals. Yeah. I think maybe COVID has, re has got us to realise that well, no matter who you are, you're actually depending on somebody. Yeah. And I think that's, what's, that's what the important lesson is. You know, the old spirit is. of the mehel. Oh, oh, very much so. Yeah. Very, and hopefully that's something that we won't lose it when yeah. COVID goes away, please God, which will be yeah. sooner rather than later. Because older people uh, do need help in, in, in some... They may be reluctant to talk about the, their health or whatever, but it is important that they, you know, they're able to get to their doctor and they, they're not struggling because they haven't got transport, that there's people there yeah. to help them and, and that the community works together to help yeah. in those sort of and ways. And of course, if you do reach out to a, an elderly person, I mean, they're... They have a fantastic store of knowledge about their community. You know, it'll be a mutually beneficial relationship for someone that does reach out like well, that. Well, I, I think certainly one of the great things, and I've often been, when I'm speaking in second level schools, it's something I say, this is obviously non-COVID non times. Mm. I mean, you say to younger people, you know, do engage with older people because they will tell you about mm. how things were in Ireland in years gone by. And maybe technology has passed out all of that, though, but it's no harm. I, I see when, I, when my own children were a bit younger and, and they saw when RT had the playback t thing that oh, they yeah. have on looking Was back. Down through the down years. Down through the years and all that. Yeah. And they see yeah. Ireland in the past and they yeah. see how people lived yeah. in those times. Yeah. I think it is important for people to understand that, that older people had things yeah. very bad, very tough. Young people might think they have it tough in this day and age and they have to be yeah. very fair to them. But older people had it tough as well. And it is important to learn that. So yeah. the whole interaction between the generations, I think, is hugely important. Yeah. And mentioning... Um, COVID, Nikki, you yourself, of course, are a survivor of COVID. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's certainly... Do you yeah. mind telling us a little bit about that experience? Well, it's about six months ago, Jerry, at this stage, and uh, my wife, Mairead, got it first. Uh, a bad kind of flu was the best way I could describe it. She got it for a couple of days, and then it hit me uh, just before Easter Sunday. It was uh, the day before um, Holy Thursday, actually. And uh, God, it knocked me like a ton of bricks now. I was, I was very ill. One consolation was I had no breathing problems because mm. I do an awful lot of swimming and it was subsequently told to me by the medical people that was a big help. But I had it, coughing was terrible and I was extremely ill now and I was very worried for a while. So I did end up going, I had my test obviously, ironically driving in into Northern Park, having the test, knowing all the times I was in there as a player, <laughs> as an administrator yeah. and all the good times and mainly good times we had there as well. And you're driving in there and getting the test and realising that 
Yeah. Clearly, I suspect that I had it. There's no question about that. Yeah. But going into hospital and uh, getting tested for a half a day, thankfully not having to stay in there because they reckoned I was strong enough to come out of it. But it was a worry. Mm. And sadly, the day I was in there as well was the day there was a memorial service for two of the staff that had died in St. Mm. Luke's as a result of it, not rest of it. And I knew one of them very well. Yeah. And uh, that was emotional, I have to say, that day. And it was traumatic. And yeah. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. So I suppose from my perspective, I'm grateful to have come through with it mm. very, very well. I'm conscious of all the people who have had very great difficulties and have lost loved ones. But it's something we have to be very conscious of. It is a terrible disease. And certainly... People just need mm. to be careful and listen to the medical advice we're being given. And, and the other point is, of course, we have a fantastic medical service, though. You know, I mean, I know it's under pressure, but the people involved are, are fantastic. Well, know? I totally agree with you there. And I would have seen that at first hand, Jerry, through the Kilkenny Age Friendly Programme, because we worked a lot with the, with the HSE and with the various service providers in Mott Carlo and Kilkenny. I was involved on committees with them. We carried out, for example, we, we carried out surveys with St. Luke's Hospital. St. Luke's Hospital, by the way, was the first age-friendly hospital in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And we'd done that through what was called a walkability study with a lot of people looking at how patients should be handled in the hospital when they came in there or people who were coming in for attention. And in fairness to the HSE, they came down and they listened and they themselves took on a lot of a big survey. How we can make a hospital environment better for somebody who is going in there who is clearly very sick, but their family are coming in and worried and be you a... A northern person or a rural person, it is the same. Going into hospital uh, is, is, not a, is generally not a good experience and it's a worrying time. So you want to make the whole experience as pleasant for the family and for the patient as possible. Mm. And to be fair to the HSE, I couldn't talk highly enough about them. They were fantastic mm. the way they embraced new ways of doing this. And they also worked with us on a, a dementia program that was uh, conducted by, uh, led by Deborah O'Neill and was uh, funded by Atlantic Philanthropies, which looked at the whole area of keeping uh, people, older people who are in the onset of dementia, how long can we keep them at home for as long as possible? Mm -hmm. And what do we need to do to support the families to keep their loved ones at home as long as possible? And again, the HSE were, were excellent coming forward with looking at their own practices in this area, mm -hmm. how they might change. And I know that the report ultimately informed a lot of the ways the HSE address these matters and uh, and for that I could not speak more had they were fantastic no I absolutely agree I think we've all experienced that in one way or another in recent times particularly I, I can't let this uh, sequence end uh, Nikki without asking you to maybe comment on the importance of sport for rural communities at the present time well, I'll probably start this by telling a small little story that's worked. The listener would probably like it because during my time as president, we got a phone call from former president Mary McAleese into Croke Park one day. She said she wanted to meet Parik Duffy and myself. Parik was the director general. Yeah. Anyway, we popped out and we would have known herself and Martin because she's a fanatic and Martin is on the GA. We went out to meet them anyway and uh, she said to us, lads, when I go around the country to meetings, all I'm seeing is women. I don't see many men there, I'm thinking older men we need to do something to get men out. So we, we worked with, with Mary and Martin and we set up a pilot scheme in four counties, in Wexford, in Kerry, in Fermanagh and Mayo. And they set up a group there t setting up activities for older men. That could be bringing in a former great GA player and talking about his life and times and discussing it with them. It could be bringing them to a match. It could be doing, so it could be a, a social evening and things like that. But I said to her then, I said, look, you know what we do? We'll bring them out to Croke Park. So we brought about 100 and, I don't know, 120 or 30 of them came to Croke Park one day and we lined up Michal and Mura Hertig oh. to meet them and to talk to them and fantastic. reminisce about yeah. it. And they were just fantastic. Now, rather ironically, out on the pitch at that very same time, the Irish rugby team were training. It was the time of the Croke yeah, Park being opened. Right, yeah. So they saw another dimension to sure. the GA. But the most amazing thing out of all that, Jerry, five or six of the people who came that day was their first time ever in, in Dublin. It was amazing. It was amazing. You would say, now that's about 10 that's years it, ago. That is extraordinary. But it was extraordinary. Yeah, it was extraordinary. And it was emotional when you were told yeah, that and you were yeah. talking to them. And they knew they were, you know, they had yeah. got into the new Croke Park. The vast majority had never been there yeah. and to be there. And we knew how important it was to them. So it's a project that it's not going on still, but it was yeah. something that was, yeah. it was dear to my heart. And I know yeah. it was dear to but uh, it, it President McAleese's heart it too. Showed, uh, how important the GAA is to people in, uh, all over the country. And you must be delighted that 
the championships are going to go ahead. I, I am. I know, I know it deserves caution because, I mean, while the club games went very well, there's no doubt about it that, they, uh, that there, was, there was, we'll call it misbehaviour, for want of a better way of putting it, uh, post a number of matches recently, which, did, which certainly contributed to the growth in the COVID cases. No question about that. Inter-county will be different because mm. it'll, be, it'll be well policed. There will not be crowds at games. And the whole programme of inter-county, the way they prepare, is, is, is much more rigid. And the, and the procedures and the regulations from a COVID operation point of view are very strict. So it doesn't mean players won't get COVID. I'm not suggesting that, but clearly it's going to be well policed. The government we know were very anxious that the GA campus would continue because they saw the um, the rest of the year we were heading into a potential lockdown at a number of weeks ago. It was going to be dark mm. evenings. What would people be doing? Having sport on the uh, on the television was going to be very important. And whether you're a urban dweller or a rural dweller, mm. that was very important. And it would it would help pass away what was seen as the cold and the and the wet and the and the. I mean, you're looking forward to the game, and that kills a few days of anticipation and then post game you can reflect on the performance and so on well that's exactly it and that's why that's why and i know even listening to radio today there's concerns about you know the sport being allowed to continue but we must understand that the impact the mental impact covid is having on people mm. is just frightening mm. and if something like sport and other activities um, that are on television can help to alleviate some of the tensions and some of the worries that people have it won't be great. Mm. It's fantastic, Nicky, to, to talk to such a passionate person about sport and about the importance of dealing with people in the community or elders who you know, have done so much for the country. By way of conclusion, what, what would you like to say? Well, I have, a little, I have a little something written. Well, I didn't write it here now, but I read this before, and I'd just like to conclude this because I think it, it, the way we should look at older people I think it is important that, you know, there will be older people looking at this, but there will be younger people as well looking at this. And well done to Chagas for this development. But I think it's important we think about older people in the context of what I'm going to read now. Okay. An old woman died alone in a nursing home. When the staff were clearing out her room, they found a letter in a drawer. It was addressed to the nurses and administrators in the nursing home, but it could have been intended for any of us. Each one of them read the letter and every single one burst into tears. It read, Dear carers, what do you see when you look at me? You see a frail old woman who isn't clever and whose habits are strange. You see someone staring blankly with dull eyes, an old woman who won't obey and who spits out her food, leaving you frustrated. Is that what you see? If this is so, then you need to look a bit closer, because this is not who I am. I am a little girl with a loving family. I am a young bride whose heart thumps because I am about to make a vow I will keep my whole life. I am a mother of two beautiful children who love and see me, who love and need me. I am growing older and wiser. My children are growing up so quickly, but I know in my heart that they will never truly leave. I am a middle-aged woman. My children have left home and my husband and I are happy on our own again. I am a grandmother. For the first time in decades, I have babies on my lap. I could not be happier. I am a widow. A dark cloud hangs over me and I mourn the passing of my husband. When I think of the future, I feel lost. I have no one to care for me. My children have children of their own. I don't want to burden them. I am an old woman. Nature shows no mercy. I feel trapped in my own body. My strength and beauty are sapped. But despite this, deep down inside me, there is still that little girl living in the ruins. In my mind, I think about all the good times I've had and the bad times too. I accept that nothing lasts. So open your eyes and look closer. You are not looking at a frail old woman. You are looking at me. Everyone has, everyone has a past full of sorrow and joy. Elderly people deserve our respect as much as anybody else because remember, Someday, we'll be just like them. Thanks, Nicky. That was lovely. And it's been a privilege talking to you. Pleasure, Jerry. To finish the programme tonight, we have a special musical surprise. We will close the programme with a video of the new single from one of Carlo's finest performers, Derek Ryan, 
with a song entitled, Wherever You're Going. And wherever you're going, go safely and adhere to the COVID-19 regulations. So good night and stay safe. That's all right.